uh, great uh, to be uh, with you at least virtually today. Um, my, my difficulty in not actually being with you in person is that I'm giving talks in three different countries during the day today, so I couldn't be um, in France and Greece and also in the UK at the same time. Um, but, but I would love to have been there. This is uh, the, the photo I took last time I was there um, at ADVAC, uh, but it's very pleasant here um, up in York in the north of England as well. So why, why do we need correlates? Um, certainly efficacy is enough uh, in vaccine development. If you can show that a vaccine works, then, uh, then it can be licensed and used on a population. But if you have a correlate of protection, and um, then that uh, does allow uh, bridging to new populations, you can avoid uh, very large scale expensive trials. Um, and it's also very helpful from a regulatory perspective to have an immunological mechanism that correlates with protection. And so there's very good reason to be working on um, correlates. And we measure those um, using uh, various different blood tests and then study um, whether they relate to protection. And uh, this uh, actually is a whole um, separate discipline is the approaches to correlating the antibody or T-cell data to the efficacy data. And I, we, we won't be able to cover that in detail today, but there's some extremely good papers on that, which I can refer you to. Now, Stanley Plotkin has written very extensively on correlates over many decades, and he's now um, abandoned uh, this um, approach uh, that's listed on this page. But it is quite helpful in thinking about the different aspects of correlates um, that we should uh, be considering. And so we're going to discuss some of these um, in the next um, 25 minutes or so. Um, now, the first um, principle in uh, thinking about correlates is defining protection. What, what are we looking for protection against? Is it infection? Um, is it disease? Is it a cost to the health system? Um, is it hospitalization? And this is critical because you have to understand um, what is uh, the, the correlate telling you, what type of protection is it talking about? And I'm just going to, um, uh, through the talk today, use a couple of COVID examples as well as from other diseases. So here is some UK data um, looking at the uh, number of cases of COVID in the UK over the last couple of years. And you can see this extraordinarily high peak of cases on the right hand side. Um, which is the Omicron variant, which I've highlighted here. Now, this is in a very highly vaccinated population who have had three doses of vaccines. And so you look at this slide and you would dismiss this vaccine if you were developing. It looks like the vaccine doesn't work. In fact, this is a combination of RNA and viral vector vaccines used in the UK over the last um, 12 months. Um, but these individuals, despite having three doses, appear not to be protected. And so if you were correlating with infection as your endpoint, uh, you would throw the vaccine out. But then when we look at the correlation against severe disease, or in this case, death, um, you see that in the most recent huge wave, um, which is on the uh, right-hand side again, um, there are actually very few deaths because the, the vaccines are highly protective against severe disease and death, as Claire Ann was saying in the last talk. And when you take into account that in recent data, between a third and a half of the deaths are incidental, in other words, they're people who died from something else um, and just happened to have COVID at the same time, uh, it makes you uh, aware that actually the, the vaccines are amazing in what they're able um, to deliver. Um, so with this as your endpoint, uh, you see a high correlation between the immune response and protection. And we could look at this with, uh, many other vaccines, varicella, we looked at short-term protection against severe disease. Uh, with rotavirus, we um, look at prevention of hospitalization or severe disease as the, as the um, protective mechanism that we're interested in, in trying to define correlates. So it's really important to understand what we're talking about. Is it infection? Is it severe disease, hospitalization, or even death? Now, it, it's um, perhaps obvious that there are uh, ways, different ways in which correlates are determined. Certainly levels of passively administered or maternal antibodies that correlate with protection are a very good way of working out what level of antibodies you need to, to be protected against a disease. And there are lots of studies um, looking at individuals who have something wrong with their immune system um, to uh, identify um, what deficit of the immune response 
um, then relates to susceptibility to infection and therefore um, what might be important in protection. And there are studies um, looking at individuals in efficacy trials, and we'll talk a bit about that today, um, looking at, in cohorts of individuals who are protected. We're looking at the individual, look at the population, um, human challenge studies, and extrapolation from animal challenge studies. So all of these might be used um, to uh, try and work out um, an immunological mechanism that appears to um, correlate um, with um, protection. Now, the second principle that's really important to raise here is that the mechanism of protection is not necessarily the same as the mechanism of recovery. And there's a lot of um, confusion um, around this area um, that there's, a, there's often different mechanisms needed to stop infection or severe disease happening. Um, so there's a different mechanism required to protect. So for example, in the case of varicella infection, um, Individuals with no antibody at all have exactly the same um, experience of the illness um, as those individuals with the normal immune system. So in the context of once you develop chickenpox, those individuals, if, as long as they have T cells, recover in the same way um, from the infection um, as someone uh, with uh, normal antibody levels. So antibody itself is not critical for recovery from infection. Um, but if you have no T cells, um, then you can't recover from infection. And you, this, for example, a child with um, severe HIV um, developed disseminated varicella infection because no T cell immunity to limit um, infection. So T cells are required uh, for recovery. Um, but we know that the vaccines uh, protect largely through the production of, an, of antibody that actually prevents infection in the first place. So that's not important for recovery if you do get infected, but it's important um, for the prevention of infection. And the reason for that is that if you give, uh, we, we can see from observations, if you give varicella, zoster, immunoglobulin, or this maternal antibody present, and then uh, infection can be prevented or very much uh, the severity of, uh, of the uh, inoculum reduced. Um, so that then, that can have an action during the incubation period to limit the infection. Um, but then once the infection has started in this later part, um, it's really T cells that are um, required. And so in those individuals who have a T cell deficiency, such as in HIV infection, or if the T cell responses are being subdued as in the late stages of pregnancy, uh, we see very severe chickenpox um, occurring if primary chickenpox um, happens. Um, and that is um, uh, very well described. So here you can see this difference between antibody preventing infection and T cells being critical to limit infection once it's occurred. So uh, the next principle I want to talk about is the challenge dose. And we've seen this, um, uh, I think all of us in the context of COVID, um, that in the hospitals, healthcare workers who were otherwise healthy young individuals who should not have got severe disease um, often did. And this is um, partly due to the exposure. And it's very well recognized for viral infections that um, a high dose um, can overcome immune mechanisms and so result in more severe disease. And even in those with very modest immunity, if they get a low dose, um, may um, actually have um, uh, no infection or a mild infection. And this is one um, uh, example of this with uh, polio, um, but uh, these are individuals who had um, been uh, vaccinated either with the oral polio vaccine or the inactivated polio vaccine. And then um, if they were challenged with a low dose of oral polio vaccine to look at shedding of the virus in the stool, um, if you'd had oral polio vaccine, only about 3% of individuals uh, shed uh, the virus in the stool and 30% of the inactivated vaccine individuals. But if they are exposed to a high dose, and then those uh, numbers increase. So those immune mechanisms are overcome uh, by a very high challenge dose. So even in an immune population, you can overcome uh, immune mechanisms by giving a very high challenge dose. And that's uh, clearly seen here with a polio example. So the next um, principle to briefly talk about is uh, the 
uh, that almost all vaccines used today were developed to detect for antibodies. And that's because it's uh, very straightforward to measure antibodies, and indeed, they are critical for uh, prevention um, of infection. They seem to be our major mechanism, other than the innate immune system, uh, for prevention of infection. So because of that, we've got levels of antibody across multiple different vaccines um, that are recognized by regulators as correlating with protection. You can see here just um, a list of some of the, uh, the vaccines where uh, we um, have um, agreed levels um, that correlate with protection um, from infection. And uh, these are all um, antibodies, some of which have been uh, assessed through efficacy trials, some through uh, passive immunization studies to find out what level of antibody is needed uh, for protection. But the situation is much more complicated than, uh, than you uh, see from these simple antibody correlates of which have been determined for regulatory purposes. And um, because co the correlate may be relative. So here, here's a, a great example um, with RSV. And uh, so this is uh, an infection which is pro uh, provides a huge burden of respiratory disease in infancy. And uh, infants have some protection from maternal antibody. So if you look along the x-axis here, the higher uh, the level of antibody, the greater um, the protection because there are fewer individuals um, who are hospitalized. But if you look here at the, uh, the, the light color, even at the very high levels of antibody, there are some uh, children uh, who are not protected, are still admitted to hospital. And, and on the other hand, um, with the low levels of antibody uh, on the left-hand side, um, there are um, some children um, who remain protected despite being infected, they don't end up in hospital. So the level of antibody is relative, and this is partly related to this issue of dose, um, but it's also um, other factors uh, in the host and in the virus which may affect um, the ability to get infected. And uh, we've seen this exact same phenomenon in the context of coronavirus. And um, here uh, from a, a study we've done um, uh, from Oxford, um, our levels of antibody um, in uh, individuals who are infected and those who aren't infected, those who have asymptomatic infection, um, and that th this is despite being vaccinated. And what we find is that there is no uh, way of looking at the antibody level in an individual and determining whether that individual will be protected from infection. Uh, they are, uh, th there isn't um, a level at which you can guarantee to be protected. Sorry, did, did someone have something? Someone saying something? I just got some feedback through the speakers and apologies. Um, uh, yes, so there's, there's no individual um, correlative uh, protection. But if we um, uh, model the data, um, it becomes clear that um, for non-hospitalized infection, we don't have the data for hospitalization, but in those who develop infection in the community, at the population level, there is a clear correlate. You can work out a level of antibody um, above which 80 or 90% of the population and will um, not develop infection. But at the individual level, there is no absolute level. But at a population level, you can derive correlates um, that indicate that that population is protected against infection. And this um, requires considerable um, background statistical um, understanding. And it's, it's um, in these various papers that I've um, listed on here um, give you a lot of information about. I strongly recommend uh, reading about uh, these approaches. Um, we uh, also, um, with the, the antibodies that are required for protection, um, there is a, uh, it's clear that they must be functional. If they're actually doing something uh, mechanistically, they must have a function. And there's an increasing emphasis from regulators over the last 20 years to demonstrate that antibodies are functional. Uh, for meningococcal disease, we've known that the bactericidal assay, these are measuring complement fixing antibodies that kill bacteria are associated with protection. This has been seen since Goldschneider in the 1960s and showed that the peak of infection in early childhood was associated with a very low level of bactericidal antibody. And as these antibodies rose over time um, through childhood and into adult life, uh, the rate of meningococcal disease became extremely low. And we have um, much evidence 
from vaccines and to say that this is also true bactericidal antibody related to efficacy of vaccines, and also from individuals who have deficiency of complement, that those with low levels of complement deficiency are particularly susceptible to getting infection with the rarer sera groups of meningococcus. So uh, here, direct evidence of this uh, being a correlate of protection, the mechanistic correlate. In the case of pneumococcal disease, uh, there's been extensive uh, study of oxenophagus sitosis, uh, uh, which is uh, a mechanism that involves phagocytes recognizing bacterial particles that have been decorated on their surface by antibody. And uh, the uh, phagocytes in the spleen then removing uh, those uh, bacteria from the blood and protecting the individual. And so if there's no spleen which holds the phagocytes and increased risk, um, if there's uh, no antibody or no complement, um, all of those are required for adding protection in the immunocopulin infection. Now, there, there is a, also a great COVID example um, here that, uh, that gives us some really interesting insights into um, the uh, mechanisms um, of protection in COVID. And so what I'm showing you on this slide are the lungs of hamsters that have been exposed to either the alpha variant of coronavirus or the beta variant. And these are very badly damaged lungs from infection. Um, and you can see uh, evidence of the virus in the lungs and the extreme damage and in inflammatory infiltration into the lungs um, in these exposed animals. So if we now take uh, another animal um, and uh, vaccinate them, we can see high levels of neutralizing antibody against the alpha variant. And if we now look at the lungs of those animals, um, we see um, that, and unfortunately it's slightly covered up on the way the slide's projecting, but uh, these are completely normal lungs, there's no virus in the lung. So this um, appears to indicate that the neutralizing antibody um, is providing um, protection of these animals um, against uh, the low respiratory disease. And so that would fit with the, the, what we see in, in many of the reports um, the neutralizing antibody is an important correlate of protection. However, um, if we vaccinate animals and then look at neutralizing antibody against the beta variant, which you can see here, um, there are no, there's no neutralization against the beta variant or very, very low levels. And yet these animals also have completely normal lungs. And so for lower respiratory coronavirus infection in hamsters and indeed in humans, neutralizing antibodies are not essential for protection. And this is very much along the lines of the comments Claire Ann just made, that for severe disease, the obsession with, uh, with neutralizing antibodies is wrong because we, we have animal and human data showing that the lungs are still protected from some other mechanism, even in the absence of any neutralizing antibodies. Interestingly, when we compare the upper respiratory tracts of these animals, uh, these alpha variants exposed animals have no virus in their upper respiratory tract, they're protected by the neutralizing antibody, but the beta variant animals have lots of virus in their upper respiratory tract, and because the neutralizing antibody is no longer present, and therefore they can still become infected. And I think this is, um, uh, shows the differences in mechanisms of protection. In the upper airway, neutralizing antibody appears to be important, but in the lower respiratory tract, um, it doesn't. And of course, there are many other antibody functions and that may be important, but are not neutralizing, um, uh, that, uh, some of which are just shown on this slide. And uh, a very interesting, a whole new area of immunology over the last 15 years of system serology to look at and the different ways in which antibody functions through the FC portion of antibody may be important in, in driving protection. And this is uh, really um, comes uh, to an, uh, sort of an associated issue and which is that there may be many different immune functions which come together um, to protect individuals um, in the context of um, uh, um, a prevention of infection. So I, I don't want you to focus on this slide. This is just to tell you that I'm going to show you a slide um, about um, malaria um, in a trial which showed with this particular vaccine that there was some protection in Kenyan adults. Um, but they had very detailed immunological analysis um, of uh, these individuals to try and work out what the correlates of protection was. And if you look each of these um, circled uh, correlates, um, so you can see there are many of them, um, had a significant correlation with protection. 
And the, the point of this slide is that incorporated into all of these different plots are antibody measures, levels of B cells, levels of T cells, different types of B cells. And many of those correlated with each other and with protection. And so it may be that there are many different factors in the immune response which are important. We generally only measure one or two of those, um, but it's a much more complicated picture. And so there's, there's examples of this in influenza and other, other diseases as well. Uh, it is important to consider not just the, the immediate production of immune responses, but also to continue mem to consider memory as an important component of protection. Um, for example, uh, we, we know that even with hepatitis B, even though the antibody levels wane over time and, and can completely disappear, the vast majority of people, even decades later, um, are still protected because they have evidence of memory. And it's the memory response during that long incubation period for hepatitis B, which is sufficient um, to confer protection, even though the antibody levels have disappeared. Um, I think uh, it's uh, hopefully becoming apparent that almost whatever you do um, in trying to understand the immune system is much more complicated than you think. One of the problems of trying to uh, simplify things in this way into these principles is that the truth of the immune system is, in, is really uh, very much more complicated. Now, if, if you're going to derive a correlate, um, then that really should contain the absolute correlate. So it should be measuring something um, which does um, relate uh, directly to protection. Um, but one good example here um, of, of where this is a bit more complicated is with Hib antibody, the, uh, the correlate of protection um, used by regulators is 0.15 micrograms per mil of antibody, uh, which we know this that level correlates with protection um, in a population. Um, but uh, here is an example from my blood. Um, I have um, a level of antibody of 100 micrograms per mil, so it's very way above the, the correlate of protection. Um, but the avidity of that antibody is very low. And if you look at the function of that antibody, which is um, the, thought to be the, the more precise mechanistic correlate of protection, which is a bactericidal um, assay, and then uh, the low avidity um, and the complement binding may be much more important than the absolute level. So even though we have published correlates, um, they may, might not in some individuals contain the absolute correlate that's required for protection because total antibody doesn't tell you about the quality of the antibody that's there. Uh, I think for many of our programs uh, that we have uh, for vaccination, um, herd immunity rather than the direct individual correlate may be much more important. And so here, if you take a, um, a group of ADVAC students um, and introduce a pathogen into the room where you're sitting today, and that pathogen can spread very easily between individuals, eventually um, striking down a susceptible individual. So that, that is the, the normal pattern of infections in a population. Uh, with COVID, it was about 1% of individuals or just under 1% who were severely affected as the pathogen spread through the population. But if you vaccinate individuals, and then that can effectively um, obstruct the transmission of um, the pathogen through the population and the susceptible individuals um, who, who are not protected through vaccination can still be protected. And we see this very clearly, for example, with meningococcal disease, uh, where those in the dark blue line who were under 19 years of age were vaccinated, and those over 20 years of age were not vaccinated. And yet, because of the um, extraordinary ability of the vaccine here to, um, to prevent infection as well as disease, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, these bacteria in, in the uh, human population dropped dramatically so that there was a reduction in disease across all ages, not just in those who've been vaccinated. I'm showing that the, a large part of the power of, of the use of these vaccines is through um, prevention of transmission rather than just um, through the prevention of infection. So as I was alluding to, sometimes we, uh, we can't find the absolute correlate. And so we use a surrogate of protection, um, which I would define as something um, which we're, is um, separate from that thing, which directly is the mechanism of protection, the absolute correlate. And so it's just related to that. And uh, 
so the way that um, I define this is a biomarker that's closely correlated to another marker that's specifically related to and responsible for, for protection from a disease. So it's one step removed from the correlate. But when you read the literature, this is very complicated because depending on uh, whether you're in the US or in Europe, um, then you will, or, or at WHO, there's a different definition uh, of what a surrogate means. So, yeah, for example, the European Medicines Agency's definition is actually our definition that we've just been discussing of a correlate. And um, so the surrogate is a predefined antibody concentration correlation with protection. That's the European Medicines Agency definition. So that is the, uh, not the way that a surrogate is used uh, by the FDA, uh, which is that it's specifically related. And this does make you very confusing. It's important when you read the literature to make sure you've understood who's writing and what, what they, their definition of these terms is. Um, so we've talked almost entirely about antibodies so far. And so I thought it's worth just thinking very briefly about T cells and their relationship. And the problem immediately comes that if you put a table up of, the, of many of the vaccines that we use, uh, we have antibody correlates for them, but we have no T cell correlates at all. And um, we, we know that T cells must be important because they're important in helping B cells in producing antibodies, uh, but we don't have um, T cell um, surrogate infection or correlates infection. And this is almost certainly um, because uh, the peripheral blood um, is a compartment where T cells are transiently present in, uh, they spend more of their time in other tissues and then, then they do um, in uh, the, 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 uh, the compartment where we can sample. And so where, if we could sample lymphoid tissues readily, we may have a better handle um, on uh, the T cell responses. Um, but also the tools are more complicated um, for measuring T cell responses. So we have really relatively um, few examples uh, which would meet um, high standards uh, statistically or from a regulatory perspective of T cells correlating with protection, although we know that they may be important and um, certainly as surrogates in helping B cells. There's, there is some evidence for a number of vaccines, for example, um, in the case of Zoster, uh, there's evidence that individuals who are vaccinated who um, develop um, stronger T cell responses um, to uh, the uh, Zoster vaccine have better protection against subsequently uh, developing Zoster. This is an immunocompromised individual. So T cell responses um, do correlate um, with protection. Um, and this comes back to this um, point we discussed earlier that T cells are important um, in limiting infection with Zoster. Um, I should just very briefly here though point out um, that some of the more recent evidence with Zoster suggests that antibodies may also be playing a role uh, with the Zoster vaccine, not just the T cell responses. And so this, um, uh, I think is uh, just shows the complexity of the system. Um, uh, to coming towards um, at the end of this um, short um, travel through correlates, um, it, it is clear that we have many more new tools um, which will allow us to uh, try and develop new correlates or surrogates. We have gene expression. Here's some uh, nice um, data from the, the first study which really showed in which the way uh, genes are switched on in peripheral blood uh, can be used to, as um, a, a predictor of protective immune responses. Here, um, with the yellow fever vaccine there were, uh, and with um, influenza vaccine, there were uh, gene expression signatures correlating uh, with the antibodies which um, correlate with protection. Um, but to come back to, to uh, the point I was making before um, about uh, the mechanistic um, correlates of protection. So this is the um, perhaps a different way of thinking about uh, this framework that we've been discussing, that there are mechanisms of protection, which may be functional antibodies, it may be that they're T cells um, that you can see here, um, but there are many different other um, uh, mechanisms which are required to get to this, uh, which may be on the pathway, they're pathway correlates, and they, they may be um, uh, uh, surrogates, where they're, they are um, types of immune responses um, which correlate statistically with this mechanism of protection. Um, and there could also be bystander responses, for example, levels of cytokines in the peripheral blood, which um, tell you something about the strength of the immune response and may still um, have a statistical correlation with protection. 
but this framework um, gives us an, a way in which we can start investigating some of these other components of the very complex immune response um, to um, identify um, mechanisms um, of protection and correlations of protection or help with vaccine development. So to conclude, um, it's really important in developing correlates for new vaccines to understand what your endpoint is, the infection disease, severe disease, hospitalization and death. Um, we have a lot of information to understand immunity um, from observations in disease and immunodeficiency and passive immunity and challenge studies that can help us work out what to pull out of our clinical trials and to try and identify correlates of protection. Um, but I think I'd, I've given some insight to the difficulty if, the, if really it's a T cell vaccine, these are really difficult um, to um, identify um, uh, the mechanisms through T cells, which are, are going to be the correlates because of the, the, uh, the limited um, standardization of tests and access to the right cell type. So the good news um, is if you have an antibody correlate. Um, it, it is, I think, very helpful to have correlates of protection uh, because this uh, really uh, is something which regulators are looking for um, today. And we, we should include in that functionality, memory and persistence, uh, because all of these are going to be really important in understanding, as we were talking about with HPV vaccines um, in the last uh, session, uh, with understanding uh, immunity over a long period of time. Um, but if you can find the correlates, it will save a huge amount of time and money um, during vaccine development. And so something which really should be thought about right from when the first needle goes in in a clinical trial and um, to make some sense um, of the immune response and to try and um, in, improve the health of populations in the future. And I'll stop there. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, I'll see how we can moderate this remotely. So we have got a good 10 minutes for questions. Okay, I see hands going up. Please start. Um, so, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Anthony from Ghana. Um, something very interesting. Uh, I think we've established that the mechanism for protection, for example, from a natural infection may not necessarily be the same um, as the mechanism for protection from a vaccine. And oftentimes uh, during preclinical studies, um, antigen discovery, we like to pay attention to the immunopathogenesis of the disease to inform how we design our antigens. This on the face value sort of appears counterproductive when we differentiate vaccine protection from protection from immunity. Um, my question here is when when scientists are investigating a disease uh, to generate data um, from the basic sciences to inform interventional studies like vaccine studies. What then should we consider and look at? Because if we consider a natural path of protection from the infection, we will see a difference. And if you, even if you do a case control study, you know where you compare immune responses from somebody who is recovering from the study uh, from an infection, you know, from when they had the infection, you will see changes in T cell responses. But will that mean that if you use a vaccine that is able to elicit that pathway, you will get you know, the protection you need. Um, what are some of the considerations we should make to make sure that we don't just generate data that may not be so useful um, uh, in terms of uptake for vaccine um, um, uh, trial uh, design? Uh, well, I, I think it's an important question. And, and the fact you answered, asked the question um, it really is the answer because you have to um, go into these studies uh, with that understanding that uh, if you um, look at um, the, the responses um, that you develop from infection, that, that is just telling you about the immune response. It's not telling you about protection. So pathogenesis studies give you an idea about what immune responses are being generated, but it, done, it doesn't tell you about whether any of those are related to protection. Well, in order to study those, you need to then re-challenge uh, those animals and, uh, or, or to have uh, re-exposure studies 
to understand which of those mechanisms were related to protection. And so, I mean, that's a, a sort of a simplistic answer um, to uh, your question. Um, but I mean, the other uh, way of looking at it is, is that uh, we have a range of tools to measure um, protection. Uh, so for example, neutralizing antibodies with viruses is, is a great example. And that's why a lot of the focus is on those, those antibodies. Um, because it's something where we understand how to develop a tool in the laboratory or just you know, measuring ELISA antibodies. We, we can measure um, those levels. But when you get into more complex questions around different T cell subsets, then you can define what happens um, in response to infection. But we still don't know without some further challenge of, of, of those T cells to understand whether they're actually uh, playing an important role in protection or it's just a phenomenon that. Uh, that those responses have been developed following infection. Okay, next question from the right side. Uh, thank you for the lecture. My name is Mary Beth from Kenya. And um, my question is really um, around whose responsibility is it to, to develop um, these measurements in terms of uh, the correlates of protection? Because yesterday in the lecture, we, I learned some new terms about probability of technical success and probability of regulatory success. And it was very clear that there have to be um, endpoints that are used by the regulator to allow um, um, maybe advancement in terms of the phases of clinical trials. And I'm just wondering who provides that, those endpoints? Is it the investigators? or is it really the regulator? And I think you mentioned in your slide that at this point, some of the, I think regulators are struggling with, with um, correlates of protection. And I know for COVID vaccines, we have used um, sort of a shorter pathway and maybe it's not the standard pathway, but whose responsibility is it to develop um, those indicators or clinical endpoints or whatever endpoints are used to adjudicate the different phases um, of licensure pathways or even clinical trial pathways? Um, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, I mean, the, the reality is that most clinical trials are not set up in a way that uh, you can readily di directly derive correlates. I mean, it's a really interesting point, but for example, in, in the COVID trials, most developers did not take a blood sample um, uh, after the second dose of their vaccine in everyone in the trial. I mean, there were some of the trials had and then 50,000 people in them. And so if you then, if you remember, you're waiting for around 150 or 100, 150 people to develop infection in the trial uh, to then be able to measure efficacy. But if you don't have blood samples from those individuals, you can't then go back and derive an individual correlative protection from the, from the clinical trial. Now, uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which we developed, and the Moderna vaccine both and had those samples, and so there are uh, there are published papers on correlates uh, from uh, from those studies. Uh, but but the other developers are not able to derive correlates because you don't have the, the blood samples to do it. And of course, that's true with many of the vaccines that have been developed over history is that we don't have uh, the information um, to do that. So it's largely a developer responsibility in designing the trials to be able to collect the samples that would allow rapid move towards correlates. Um, but usually that in a normal development cycle is done in discussion with, uh, with regulators, uh, showing to them the evidence that it's the right thing to be measuring. And then a lot of work to standardize the assays so that we can believe um, that when someone applies um, the, these correlates, that you get a reproducible result. And in, and in fact, the, the work on the assays is something which is, is often the hardest part um, of all of this is to actually get something re that's reproducible and reliable. So I think it's, I mean, it's a partnership between the developers and regulators in, in doing that. Um, I, I should also just mention WHO here, because um, if you look at the pneumococcal uh, vaccine correlates, um, a lot of the work was, uh, was coordinated with WHO um, as well. So it it's, um, it's involves uh, standardization people in, in regulators, um, as well as these, these other groups. Hi, this is Kathleen Dooling from CDC. Um, so during the COVID trials, usually the immunologic endpoint was uh, compared to a group that was con 
termed convalescent SARA. And in many studies, this was ill-defined and it was difficult to, to know exactly who those patients are and what their clinical course was. Do you think that there should be some standardization and um, description of, of clinical course uh, for convalescent SARA? I thank you. I, I think that's a great um, question because I, I, I think those, um, uh, those studies where, uh, where, where there, there was a, a group of SERA um, collected sometimes from asymptomatic individuals, sometimes from severe disease, um, were, are a very poor way um, of then um, defining a control. Because as you say, every trial can use a different set of SERA. I think what perhaps looking back as an international community, what we got wrong is we should have had a panel of those SERA, um, which everyone was given to use uh, for that standardization. So all the developers were using the same. Um, but I, and for, for exactly the reasons that you, you raised, it, it just made it extremely difficult to do these extrapolations. And there is a publication um, by Curie um, et al, where they've used um, data uh, from these uh, standardizations. And to my surprise, see a reasonable correlation with the, uh, the efficacy data that are then um, produced from the trials. I, I think there has to be something wrong in those analyses because, uh, as you say, the, the, uh, the, um, the sera that are derived are so different between the different um, trials. And the inputs in the trials are also different, which means that it shouldn't work, but it does seem to in the, um, the analysis that they've done. Uh, my name is Elke from Switzerland. I have a question. If you were asked by regulators to evaluate cell-mediated immune response of your vaccine in a clinical trial, how, how would you do that? Well, fortunately, at the moment, uh, regulators, when they, they do ask for that, and they have been doing for the COVID vaccines, um, but they, they're asking for supporting data to show that there are T-cell responses. And uh, I, my view is that it would be best to be doing assays which are easiest to standardize. And so, for example, T cell early spots, uh, gamma interferon early spots are relatively easy to standardize. Um, but once you move into flow cytometry assays, uh, most um, uh, use of those, uh, you know, whether it's the obstetrophagocytosis assay for a pneumococcal vaccine or T cell assays, um, it's very hard to get consistent results across laboratories um, in doing that. Um, so I, I would try very hard to avoid agreeing anything with the regulator that was difficult to, to actually make reproducible. Um, but also with, with uh, things like um, intracellular cytokine staining, I, I, I think we just don't know what it means. I mean, you, you, know, you can show different patterns of T cell responses, but we don't know what we're trying to get in order to have a vaccine which is good. Um, so I, I think having evidence of the T cell response is probably important, but, but we don't know what the right response is. Thank you. Great. I, I think. Right. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. My name is uh, Al Hadi Ibrahim Ture. I'm from uh, Senegal. Uh, my, my question is uh, as a regulator, what uh, visual definition can we use when we evaluate uh, protocol research or uh, marketing authorization dossier? Sorry, so just ask the question again. Uh, I say, uh, what, which, which definition, definition we will use when we evaluate uh, protocol research or marketing authorization dossier as a regulator? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite understanding which, which assay or which correlate? Between uh, surrogate or uh, uh, correlated. Oh, oh, I see, the surrogate which definition or the you can use there. I, well, I think the important thing is to define what you mean. Um, so I, I don't think the, the, the term matters uh, very much. Um, I, I find the use of surrogate um, confusing because it doesn't work for me in the English language, um, but the European Medicines Agency used the term surrogate. So I, I don't think it matters so much, but it must be defined what you mean when you use the term. So I, I'm, I'm more with the, the US definitions. We have time for maybe yeah, one more question. Hi, my name is Alma Fullery from Australia. Um, Andy, thanks for a great talk. I just have one question around 
human challenge studies, and I did see it on your slide somewhere. Um, are there any examples of where human challenge studies have been used successfully to identify a correlate, particularly for a paediatric vaccine? Yeah, um, th thanks for that uh, question. I, I, I mean, I, I think my talk needs to be about two hours long to actually include the examples of, of there are so many of them in correlates. It's such an interesting area. Um, the uh, human challenge studies uh, certainly in the last uh, 50 years have been done almost exclusively in adults. And so any correlates derived from them is, is, is obviously from um, adult examples. And um, we've got a number where um, potential correlates are identified. Now, the difficulty is then validating those correlates because you, you then need further studies in equity trials to do that. Um, so, for example, we, we've used um, a human challenge model in my team of typhoid, and we've identified both IgA levels um, as well as antibody dependent um, neutrophil phagocytosis as being associated in the challenge model with protection. And uh, we, we will um, this year go on to do some further work to hopefully to validate that in the challenge model. And um, the difficulty is proving that in the field in, in pediatric trials. We, we certainly see different levels of IgA in the field with lower levels in the youngest children and higher levels as you, as you climb through school age. Um, now that does uh, or may turn out in the long run to be associated with differences in protection by age. Um, but so far we don't have any data to show that. Um, so I think we'd, we'd, I can't think of a good example immediately of where an absolute correlate has been derived from a challenge model, but it does give you ideas of things that you can then go and look at in the field trials um, to evaluate in more detail. And it may be that this particular one um, uh, will turn out to be true in, in the, the years ahead. Thank you. 